Okay. <laughs> so welcome to the Badger Study Session. So, uh, so Badger, we already know Badger is this um, key value store. We've been studying a lot of key value stores, but Badger is a disk um, based key value store. Mm -hmm. It, in a sense that it tries to, by the default behavior is that it tries to make sure everything you write is persisted to disk. Which I think that's also yeah. part of the ACID compliance thing. So it's more consistent compared to bond DB, which we studied last time, where um, bond DB tries to keep things in memory, then at intervals, for example, one yeah. second intervals. You should write the disk. Yeah. Kind of eventually consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah. The the thing with Badger, I think what makes Badger different. Um, I don't well the thing with Badger is that or, or similar databases that try to write to disk is that they have to find a way to work around how slow the disk can be. Scanning on the disk um, is really it's slow because you have to do a lot of operations. Actually, you need different algorithms if you are working with with spinning disk. That's the traditional hard disk we used to use. You need a different algorithm to be efficient with spinning disk than you would need if you want to deal with SSDs because. Um, yeah, but today we are studying a Badger. Badger focuses on SSD. So uh, when I was actually jumping into the project, I had to learn from perfect and go the path of running tests. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. OK. So I started with this test in um, db underscore test um, update and view because this this alone will allow us do the two primary uh, operations and bond db, which is to save like to save a key and then to get an existing key. So this. I'm sorry. And this give me a minute. Are you okay? Yeah, I have what I'll be fire to make tea. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, if you notice already, just from the API, it's quite similar to the bond DB API. So we have this update function, which accepts. So we have this update method, which accepts like a function with a transaction. And in this, in this function, you can do anything you want to do. So in the case of updates, you can make any changes and then those changes will be persisted. While in the case of view, you can make, you can view things, but if you make any changes, those changes will be discarded. So we can start with updates. Uh, but before we go into updates, we can already look at um, what you do, what what you do in in Badger. So usually Badger is a disk um, heavy database. It persists everything to disk. So you need to give it a path. Also, there's a Badger dot open function. But the most important argument you give to it is a path or a folder where it can store all of the files it creates. 
I mean, you can give it other options, but the other options don't matter quite as much. Um, level size, max table size, but I need to come across this later, so we'll see why this might be important. But usually the default values are more than enough. Outside of this, sorry. Outside of this, I think the other important setting would be in memory, whether you want it to write to disk or not. I mean, I don't see any reason why anyone would want to use Badger for in memory when there are already a lot of perfect, nice, and simple working in memory um, key value stores out there. But yes, but this option exists. Um, so the most important operation, or the first operation is that you have to create an instance of the Badger database given the options. Yeah, all of these are just configurations, just checking to make sure you don't give configs, um, configuration settings that are invalid or that, that are not compatible with each other. But um, if we go down, we can see some important ones, for example, memory map. So there are some settings that you can do in Badger. One is that you can indicate if Badger should write, like your write operation, should it go straight to the file, like to the actual file on disk without any caching layer or something. Because what Badger does is that it opens any file, it opens the database file, Maybe I can show you in here. Can you see these files here? Can you? See you guys there? Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, uh, there's just three of us, I think. Maybe we can. No, we are four actually now. Someone is about joining. Oh, nice. So please don't leave me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, just if you have questions or you have things you want to add, please jump in. You know, there's only so many of us who can be interactive and yeah, I mean that's the idea. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it kind of looks to me that it can operate in three minutes. Yes, exactly. I mean, not really, but yes. So let me, I can explain these three options. So this file I O is that um, these files. Every, every time it wants to make a change, it's going to write directly into this file. Let me show this one, this, and this. You understand? Well, well, for this second option, load to RAM, just means that it's going to load the file into RAM and be modifying the file in RAM. Then at intervals, maybe the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then at interval, it will save the version of that file in the RAM to disk. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's kind of weird. Want to do Yes, yes, ish, but different. Um, so in the case of BondsDB, BondsDB has a like a value log, which is writing to disk each time. While this guy, this in this case, they actually have a representation that's the the storage mechanism how the data is represented in for search and for everything is how it is represented in the file in bonds db you cannot really search in the file you have to load that file into into the tree into the out tree i think it's out tree the db plus tree. i don't remember which tree but yeah in the case of bonds db you have to load the file into the data structure and memory before you can search or do any operation does that make sense? Yes. Uh, so here, the format in which it is in the file is already, you know, designed to allow them to seek and go to the exact point of what they are looking for in the file. So anyway, the difference is that we can work directly on the file in the file system, or we can load that file into memory. That just the byte of the file. We load it into memory and do those operations in, in memory. Or we can do something called memory map. So memory map is actually a Unix operation. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I keep doing this, but let me make sure I don't get my gas. <laughs> I have trust issues in myself. Okay, um, welcome, Uche. Welcome, Uche. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Uche, did... <laughs> so, um, just to give you a, a, a quick overview of what we've done so far. We, we just started looking into the um, Badger database, and we're looking at how the open operation works. So first of all, you open, you give it a, a, a folder where it's going to store all the, you know, store your database stuff. <laughs> and then in that, in that, with that folder, it's going, okay, this is where we are actually, within this open operation, yeah, okay. they're studying the different modes which um, Badger can operate in. And those three modes, which is what we are talking about now, is the file I.O. mode, the RAM mode, and the memory map mode. So file I.O. I o just means it does everything in the file directly. RAM means that it keeps a representation of the file in memory. It's just as a byte, actually. It just, okay. it just has a byte slice where it copies the file into. Now, memory map is almost the same as this load to RAM. The difference is that memory map is actually a Unix operation where you can, you know, you can tell the uh, operating system to, mem to map a file to, say, a position in memory. And maybe, I think it returns a pointer or something. But anyway, so the operating system is going to keep both that um, file on the disk and the file in memory in sync with each other for you automatically. It's, it's a very common app. That's also what uh, uh, MongoDB does, for example. They keep all the actual, um, they keep all the actual files in disk, but then map them to memory. One advantage of memory mapping is that you don't have to map everything. Sometimes you can map just a part of the file into memory. For example, with files that are too large to fit into memory. So I have I have on. a question. Sorry, is okay. there any one that is better of the three, the memory map, the load to RAM, or each of them just have the advantages? Is there any one that you think okay, this is the one that you would prefer to go with? I think it's about advantages. If your file, if your disk is is too big to fit into memory, usually you just use file I.O. If I'm having terabytes database, I can't expect it to fit into memory. But memory map is the better option because you allow the operating system um, sort of figure out what part should be in memory for you. Sort of. Okay. So it's like, it's, memory map is like a caching functionality by the OS. So to keep the files that you are editing very often or that you're modifying very often in memory so that the operation actually just happens in memory and then gets saved. Um, if your files are very small, I would, you, I would go between the RAM mode and the memory map mode. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. So um, Badger also supports compression. I didn't really, I mean, I saw, I looked at the code where we do all the compression, but I didn't study it deeply because there's so much happening in Badger. <laughs> you can't really go into detail about every single thing because it's huge. So, but it supports, um, actually it supports this Z standard compression and snapping. Yeah, Z standard and snapping. Um, this, yeah, we don't need to talk about them, but they are mostly, this standard is a Google um, compression that's supposed to be fast, right, I think. Fast, fast, very fast compression. Well, I don't remember. But anyway, this is not very important. <laughs> then, yeah, we have this that I do not really understand. <laughs> Yeah, so it also supports a read-only mode. Uh, so you can open a database read-only. 
And um, yeah, so this is where the magic happens. If you are not in memory, you know that if you can write to this, it would create the folders. Nothing much happens here. It will just create the directory where you want it to where you want it to store the files. Exists. Uh, make directory. So it will create the directories, and then. Um, there's an option, there's something called the local guard, which we're going to see later. Oh, anyway, we'll see it now. So anytime you, when you create a directory, it acquires a lock on that directory so that you cannot, the reason for this is that you can't have two applications within the same Badger database. And yeah, it's, 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 it's just an, an OS thing, you know, just a Unix thing. It does a, a Unix F lock to acquire the lock, a lock on that. Um, on, I think it creates a file. It opens the directory. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. No. So it creates, it creates a file with the PID name, but this is supposed to be just for convenience yeah. purposes. Yeah, coordinating. No, this was this is supposed to be just for convenience purposes. It doesn't use this um, PID file. But anyway, bottom line is just that it locks this folder if only if it is not um, read only. If it is ah sorry, now I, I, I was mixing something up. So this um, PID file, it doesn't create it. If the directory is read only, it's just the, the file is just for convenience so that if someone is locking on a particular folder, you can easily go and check the PID. And you know, if you are debugging, then you can manually unlock or kill the process that's reading that's locking that file. But anyway, lock the folder. That's just the long story. And then, yeah, this is just clean up. Um, yeah, really not much happens here. Acquire directory lock like before. It acquires, so there are two directories. I mean, it depends, but you can have a, a, a value directory, which is here we just acquire a lock on the value directory, but we'll get to that eventually. So, but you can see all of this. So this is the value log. This is the, I don't know what SST means, but it's pretty much, a representation of the of the database, I think the LS, LSM database. Then there's the manifest. There, everything is binary. They use uh, protocol buffers to encode to encode most of the files. And we're going to see this soon. So yeah. that's why it's it's a binary yeah. representation. Sorry to draw you back, but I want to ask: What's the difference between this budget? And other DBs that you use, like what? What is the standout difference? Is it just another one, another different type? Okay. I don't Which, my give me an example of a database you are comparing it with. Uh, so Postgres as an example. Uh, so Badger is is a is a key value store. Like Redis. Sorry. It's ah, uh, it's like we had this, but it's different. So Postgres, MongoDB, any database you mention, if you go and look into their code, yeah. behind the scenes, all of them are built on top of key value store. So key value, a key value store is the lowest pr primitive, is the like the lowest level which all the other databases build on top of. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay, okay, with, okay. With, with Badger, you can build a Postgres or a Redis or pretty much any other kind of database you want to build. Oh, okay. Mm. So All right. more like an engine. The okay, most popular okay. database that, can you see my browser? Yeah, I can. So the most yes. popular database that is using um, Badger is something called DGraph which is relatively new, but it's a graph database. 
And it's also very fast. The speed is one of their selling points. And that speed, which, they, which is their selling point, is pretty much as a result of Badger, nothing else. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Yeah, the website is very fine. It doesn't miss fine like a month ago. <laughs> yeah. So it's very fast. It's built like a search engine. Queries are booking to self queries, blah, 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 which run concurrently to achieve low latency and higher throughput. All of these are basically talking about Badger. Okay. Because the actual reading and writing from file is as a result of that key value stored behind the scenes. So what most databases are is, is that they are just, um, they're just like compilers. They, they compile the query which you give to them and return operations, read and write operations on a normal key value store. Okay. Okay, so let's go back. Yeah, and then um, I think, sorry, just to quickly, um, is it interject or uh, Uche? I think this is your first time joining this session, right? Yes, I was scared yeah. to join, but like, what's the worst that happened? Yeah, that's the idea. Like, I mean, it's not like we are all trying to like learn different things. So, before yeah. we, we look, we, we had already looked at um, uh, was Bunt DB, which was a kind of key value store, but uses like some different principles, like in memory, and basically we try to understand like its its um, its its data structure and how it kind of handles things in memory. So we felt a good. Or we also looked at like distributed like distributed consensus. Um, that was like, but then we now try to like the natural progression was to check okay. How does something like Badger, which is also kind of like a key value store, but gives the option of like file, like a file storage store, not necessarily an in-memory store. So we just wanted to, we are, so we are, we are studying this to actually see, okay, how does it try to achieve its so-called ACID compliance? Uh, let me say so-called, uh, let's just say ACID. <laughs> ACID compliance. And uh, so, that, I mean, that's like the old, the old Aim of what we are doing here. So um, I guess you could try and check out the other ones. We left some notes, and um, I think there's a recording of one of our sessions. You can check them out too. On YouTube. Okay, we'll do. Well, welcome. Yeah, Sorry, I'm going back to you. It's okay. Welcome, Uche. So I had no idea that this is your first session. Yeah. I if if I come across things that we've seen before, I will try to mention them. All right. But do you have experience with Go before now? Yes, yes. Yes, I do. Okay. More Go. Yes. So the code is not too strange, right? No, 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 it's not. Okay. Well, I'll just... having a whole lot more, but then it's not. Mm -hmm. I'll try to go over things gradually, but because of how huge the project is, I can't go like line by line, you know, explaining everything. No, sure. I, I wanted to just have an overview of exactly the why. I'm, I'm usually tied to the why. I don't understand mm -hmm. why, I'm, why yeah. I'm here. Then probably I will not follow, but now I understand why. <coughs> please go on, yes, go on. Yes. If I have questions, I'll ask, please. All right, thanks. So, um, uh -huh. So let's continue. So now you understand what it is. It's the engine which you can build databases on top of. And it's very important. So before, um, in our last um, meetup, we studied um, a different database called BondDB. So if you notice, I was making a lot of references to BondDB before. And BondDB is kind of like Badger. The only difference is that BondDB focuses on keeping all of your data in memory in your RAM. So while Badger focuses on keeping all of your data in your hard disk or in your disk. So they have different use cases and different advantages and disadvantages. But today we are studying the one that keeps your data on disk. Anyway. Um, so let's continue. So there's a manifest file, which I think is just metadata really. I, 
I did not see anything fancy, but I think it just stores metadata about your request. For example, um, is it read only? Is it you know just metadata about the database about what's running at the moment? So there's nothing special we need to see in here. And then this is very important. We create uh, the open function creates an instance to a database struct. If you go into the database, we'll see. Aha. Uh -huh. So in this database, there is a lock, as usual. There is a, this directory guard. Remember when we opened um, when we opened this this files directory, we got a lock. So this is this kind of holds the file. It, 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 yeah, it's it's. I thought there's supposed to be a mutex in here. Yeah, but it holds the file, it holds the path and some metadata. We kind of assume that there will be a lock in there. But I, don't okay, think okay. You, I, don't, I don't think you need a lock anymore since, I mean, yes. when creating the file, you've already kind of um, like... Yeah, we created the lock here already on the yeah. Unix level. Yeah, so there's no need. So this just holds the... Um, the files then this is super important man like i don't know if there's time we can go into detail and i can show you how a skip list works so apparently every database at least the research around databases right now is that almost every database which writes the disk uses this data structure called a skip list. So a skip list, maybe I can give a very quick overview so that it will make sense when we start using it or when we start seeing it in use. So a skip list is a kind of linked list. Do we know what a linked list is? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. So a linked list is just a data structure where each node points to the node before it or the node behind it. So a node like this, like one, would point to the node before it. Actually, it's usually unidirectional, but sometimes you can have bidirectional. bidirectional. But yeah, so each um, node just points to the node, node before it, like that. So if in some programming languages, like in Elm, for example, some especially functional languages, um, they might not have the equivalent of an array. So they tend to use a linked list as the alternative of an array. But they are not the same. Linked list, looking up a specific position in a linked list, for example, looking up number five, is not as fast in a linked list as if you had just looked up in an array. But that, no, it's not. So a, um, a skip list skip. Is, is basically... Um, an improvement of a linked list such that we have the bottom has the linked list and then in each level we have another list and then above that level we have another list up to a particular height which we determine um, how it works is that so the for every level above a link a, a particular um, linked list um, the node would point okay so the node above would point to the node of the list below it and the node of the list above it and then an item in front of it. So how, another important um, information of how it works is that for the new levels, we can call this a level. For a, a new level, it's, we decide whether to, okay, wait, let me, um, I think I'm, there's a lot about it, but I'm trying to just say the most important things. Yeah. Um, so we have a level. If, if we put an item into a list, for example, we inserted item one. We, we use based on, we based on probability, decide if to put that same item in a level above it and the level above it. So when I put two, so they do it by say, throwing a dice. Or, train a, or flipping a coin. So let's say I put two and I'll flip a coin. If it is heads, then I'm going to replicate this same item in number two into a level above it. The same thing for three. 
you know, when, when, when I'm click three into the, into the skip list, I'm going to flip a coin and it, if it's head, I'll also put it in the level above it. And then I flip a coin again until it fails. So the advantage of this is that when you are reading, if I want to read this list, so remember I told you that picking a specific item in this in a link list can be expensive. It can be n, yeah. It can be n um n um complexity, time complexity. You know, we, I hope we all know what time complexity is. I yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, okay. So it just means we have to walk walk the link list one one element at a time. One, two, three, four, five, six. But with a, a skip list, if I want to find item six, I don't start by working at the bottom. I start by working at the highest level. So I, I, I'm looking for six. So I click, I, I come to the first index. I check, is this index um, uh, less than or greater than six? If it's less than, I want to move to the next item. But in this case, there's no item. So there's no item to go to next. So I'm going to go down by one level. So in this next level, I check the next item, which is four. Is four less than or greater than six? If it's less than, then I'm going to jump and come to position four. In position four, I check the next item. Is the next item less than or equal to six? If it is, then I'll just jump, and now I'm, I'm on position six. If you notice, I only have to do two jumps, as opposed to doing one, two, three, four, five. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So it's a kind of optimization for working the list without having to go to each single item. But in the perspective of a database, it's more important in a database because uh, based on the implementation, Okay, anyway, let's go back. We're going to come to this later, but I think we already have the important details we need yeah. to know. Um, let's go back to the code. So we use skip list to represent all of our data in memory before they get persisted to disk. Does that make sense? So um, every, time, every time you write a, a new key, we will put it in a skip list. So we have a list of skip lists. What they basically do is that this is the current, at each point in time, there's an active skip list. So whenever we, I think when we hit maybe a particular limit or something on the skip list, we move the entire list into this IMM. So we flush yeah. that, we move it in here, and then empty the skip list so that the new items can keep going to the skip list. So it's kind of like um, buffers, like buffering in a way. So we have the manifest file. Then we have this levels controller. This levels controller is very important, and we're going to see why soon. But it basically handles writing to the actual physical disk um, table, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so each table is representative of the actual files, these SST files that we are performing the write on, like the actual writing to this. Remember when I told you about memory map? So anytime a file is memory mapped, the data that is memory mapped is stored in these bytes. Okay. There are other things in here. Do we know what a Bloom filter is? Well, yeah, at least from no. Okay, I'll show you. It's, a, it's an important data structure to know, especially when you start working in companies that you know, well, do a lot of things at scale. All this, but well, most um, blockchains tend to use Bloom filters to like yeah, find for the lookup path. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a Bloom filter is a space efficient data structure. Oh, this is showing us so much. It's a space efficient <laughs> data structure. I would is probably not the best. <laughs> <laughs> so let me share an example. So the way it works is that if I want to, if you want to check if you've come across something before, it's um, it, it uses probability. It can tell you for sure 
that it has never come across a value before. But it cannot tell you for sure if it has come across that value before. Does that make sense? Let me show you an example. Let's say this is our data structure. Um, it's, this, in this case, it's represented as, um, I don't know, like an array right. of bits. Yeah, or a vector of bits, yeah. So you put something, let's say, um, perfect. So what happens is that it hashes anything you put into it and then represents it in this vector. So this whole text, perfect, ended up only taking two points. This is how it's space efficient. I can also put Anthony. I can put very long string, blah, blah, sheep. See, and at the end of the day, this is, this is very efficient. We, we just have like, I don't know, this can fit into one byte. So we can have like a lot of things in here and it's only taking a very little amount of space. But now if this, this also grows, like you can put in millions of records, although maybe you might need to increase this bit uh, yeah. more, but you can put in millions of records, like millions of records, and you're using maybe one, one kilobyte or one byte, or, or like, you know, like just a few bytes. Okay. Now, when, when it becomes important is for looking up. So if I look up a value that is not in this list, for example, if I look up, um, uh, let's look up penny. You see this? Is element in the set? No. So it knows for sure that the element is not in this set. So you but, don't need to. You don't need to like look through the actual elements to find anything. Or yes, you don't need to set. look through. But the Iron is that if an element is actually in the set, it will not know for sure. <laughs> what is the probability? <laughs> yeah. So if I give it an item that is actually in the set, it is like maybe, maybe it's there, but I'm not sure. So you cannot use it to be sure that you've gotten something, but you can use it to be sure that you've not gotten something. So how is why is this important in 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 a file system like this? It's very important because if you want to. Let's say if you want to look up um, a key in the disk, going to the disk to perform a read, to perform a scan is very expensive. You know, right? But with a blue filter, you can already check. And if you, you check this key, you can be sure that if, 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 it's, if it returns that, no, this key does not exist. You are sure that this key does not exist on the disk. And you don't have to go ahead to do all those expensive operations of reading. You can already return earlier and tell the caller that, see, we don't have this key. Then if it is a maybe, then you cannot finally go to this and try to find that key and find the associated value. Does that make sense? So it's a very yeah. important um, yeah, optimization for this. And I think for any database that's writing to this and that wants to optimize its processes. So there are other things, and we're going to come across this in more detail. It's a very huge data, uh, data. I mean, it's not huge, say, in comparison with Redis, but that, I, I would say the file size is getting very close to that of Redis. Uh -huh. So let's go back. We'll see some of these things later. Mm. Yeah, so we have this. So another thing we have in the DB struct is that we have um, a cache. So the cache um, blocks in memory, but let's ignore the cache. We should have just a cache, you know, in memory cache. But let's ignore this for today because I did not dive too deep into it, into when it caches and when it doesn't cache. So this just creates an instance of that database. Yeah, there's some cleanup, mm, some compaction, some memory flow, just basic cleanup. So then it's um, dive deep in there. So this is just configuring that cache I showed you, the restrict cache. Uh, we don't need to go in there. It's not very important for the operations of the database. Uh, so this is very important. So this levels controller, I think we already saw it. Oh no, before that, you can see the skip list I mentioned before. Remember I told you that this um, variable empty 
holds the current species which the database is populated. So every time you create a new write, it puts it in the current skip list. Until that skip list hits its limit. So, so the skip list has its size. Just and you see this height that I showed you. Height is just to represent. Oh, fuck! I already closed the skip list. So this height is the height of how many levels you have. So in, in this example, you see in this code here, it, the height is four. So in here, I think they, st they start with a height of one, although they have a max height, yes. So there's a max height, but when you start, you start with a height of four, of, of one, and then you consistently keep increasing the height until you hit the max height for each new item you insert. So we create a skip list, the current skip list, and then the levels controller. Remember, skip list keeps everything in memory. So it, things are kept in memory before they go to the disk. Levels controller is what actually handles um, storing those changes to actual files, to the actual file system or the memory map or whatever. So this is just initial um, some code to initialize new levels controller. You you give it a number of levels. I still don't fully understand how these levels work, even though I saw the code and I read the code and all of that, which is would have helped if there was some document describing the architecture. But on the basic level, we know that each they have a concept of blocks. So a block is like, um, um, like a block of mem of bytes, which is set into a file. I don't know how to put it, but each block is represented by a table, and a table has a, is represented by one file mostly. So then you create a file which you now put in the table, something like that. Um, I think we can skip this when we and instead just jump into how the files work when we get there. Uh, so here there's a value log. If the value log is kind of similar to the log we had in Redis. So every time you write a file, it goes into a value log and then gets added into the LSM that's into the file system. The value log is kind of like the Redis one. It persists line, like, line by line. The only difference is that this is a value log. The only difference is that each line is it's binary. It's a um, protocol buffer encoded. Which should, is, does that mean it's going to be, anyway, it should be faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More yeah, compact, yeah. actually. Sir. It will be more compact and it will be faster. A benefit. Unfortunately, it's not readable by us. <laughs> All right, so let's continue. So we're looking at open. Yeah. So this is not the exciting part yet. I'm just showing how the important right. things that we initialize for later use. Um, yeah, they get the head key, but let's not jump in there because we'll see code that we need to study later soon. Um, they have something called a uh, mark. What's it called again? Water oh, marks. Okay. Yeah, well, they have some sort of water mark which they mark, but that's not important for now. There's a right channel. This is very important. And we're going to see the use later on. The reason is that every time you write, you are pretty much just putting it in a channel for someone else to pick up the job and write it to disk. But we're going to get there. And then there's a concept of publishers. For the purpose of this of today, we are not going to study those publishers, those subscribers. We'll focus on the update and get operations. All right, let's go back. Aha. I'm sorry. What the hell? Uh, yes, we're here. So now we've seen what happens here. In here, we open the new 
database instance and then just pass it down for to be ready to be used in the test. Now, um, for those of us that studied bonds DB last time, we already saw a similar API like this. Yeah. Where we have an update method, which you can do anything in there, and whatever you do, we will get persisted. Then we had a view method, which you can do anything, but anything you do will get discarded. Where you can perform reads and do a, a lot of stuff. Now let's start with updates. Now you see, like it's it's almost as if they just copied the same code in um, in Bones DB. But I know it's a very common API. So what 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 I mean is that the code for view and the code for update is almost exactly the same. The difference is, is just that one also executes commits, transaction.commit, while the other does not commit. But both of them execute this function. So what we're going to do is that we're going to, we'll, we will go back before we study how this update actually works. Let us see the most important operation that happens in an update which is to set. So an update gets a transaction, and then we can now set a key. So you can set an entry, an entry is just the key value and This is it, you can see, this is the key, and then we can put in any value. Badger works with bytes, so anything you have to do has to be in the byte uh, representation. So we can set that entry, which is the key and the value. In this set entry, it calls transaction.modify. And inside modify, here it just does a lot of checks. If, so that um, this, for example, make sure that you don't perform a set operation when you are in a view, when you are doing transaction.view, which, which means you're not supposed to be able to edit or make any changes. So to return with only transaction. <laughs> this here, is if the transaction has been cancelled already and you're trying to perform an operation on it, discarded or cancel transaction, then to return an error. Then this is if you try to make to save a key, a value where the key is empty to return an error. Then, then this is not supposed to ever happen. This happens if you try to call this method without first calling, there's a helper function called new, new entry. What it does is that it prefixes the key with one of several operations. So these are the different prefixes. It can be this, it can be head for the, um, this is usually for the first item in a block. Then, if, if, a, if a key, we are going to come across all this. Let me not go into detail. These are minor details. Um, but yeah, so it just tries, this one just does some checks to make sure that everything is okay. For example, that the value is not too large. If it's too large, it will return an error. If the key is too large, it's also going to return an error. If you are in memory, and then you are trying to write a value that's larger than you know the limit for keeping things in memory, then to return an error. So just different things. Then here it checks the size. I think it checks the size of both the key. Yeah, transaction to be so you can do a lot of set set operations in a single transaction. Let me go slowly and calm down. So you can you can do a lot of set operations in a single transaction. Um, let me put it side by side so that we can be seeing what I'm talking about. So if if you notice in here, is the font too small? Should I make it a little bigger? For me, it's okay. It needs, it needs bigger. I'll be fine. Why resolution? Okay. Is this okay? Is this okay? 
It's okay for me. All right. So if you notice in this transaction, it, it, well, sorry, inside this update function, you can call transaction.set as many times as you want. In this case, they are doing a for loop and then they are running transaction.set you know, 10 times. Does that make sense? Are you guys there? Please interact. Please do not put yourself on mute. <laughs> Locking it in any way. In this case, you don't, they don't lock because don't, this transaction is is separate. So I'm going to what I'm going to show you why this is important. But so in here you can run as many set operations as you want within the context of a transaction. At this point, it does not go to disk yet. It only goes to disk at the end of this function. So when it, at the end of this function, if you're going to update, you'll see that it calls something called commit. This commit is what actually does all the saving operations. But we'll get there soon. Baby steps. All right, so let's go back here. This is where my mouse is. So, um, where were we? Aha, uh -huh. check size. So, because you can run as many set operations as you want, there's a chance that you might run way too many set operations. So, this is just basically checking that the total number of, of sets that you are doing. Actually, yeah, that the total number of sets is not larger than. There's a there's this configuration for what the maximum size of the transaction should be. And if that's the case, it will return an error. And then so remember that we're still studying set entry. So after all these checks, the next thing it does is um, that this doesn't really this is checks to make sure that you don't have like the same key twice. But this is not so important. Uh -huh. Now, this is where the important thing happens. It's so when you call the set entry, for each transaction, there's a map of two things. So there's a map of duplicate. This is a transaction struct. So there's a map that contains depending rights, which is just a map of the key to the entry. Then anytime you have duplicate entries or you have a right that you know there is duplicate you add it to this um, slice that is pretty much all there's also reads so anytime you do a read um it adds it in here but it only does this if the transaction is an update transaction but that is not really not important the two important things is the spending rights and duplicate rights so first thing it does is that it checks if the, that key which you gave to it already exists in the pending rights map. So if that key already exists, then that means it was a duplicate key and then it appends the key into this um, slice of duplicate keys. Otherwise, it adds the new, the new entry into the pending rights entry. <laughs> it's just a map in memory. It doesn't persist, it doesn't do anything. So that's what set entry does. Does that make sense? It looks simple, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so delete is roughly the same. It's just that it creates a new entry with your key and a meta for deletion. So it's just going to pick this and then put it into that um, slice that I showed you, depending right slice. Okay, let's go back. So that's what set entry does. So at this point, after running all of set entry 10 times, now in this transaction, we have a slice of all the entries that need to be persisted for this particular transaction, not for the entire database, just for the particular transaction. We now have this map of all the entries, but, that, but those entries have to be persisted somehow. So this is the function that calls that we give to it. 
So now we have all the um, all the entries in the in the map. We now call commits to actually do something about them. Now this is what commits does. Sorry. It just does some checks. So if the um, pending right is empty, it just returns new. It means you did not make any change. Then it does some checks. Yeah, it just does some checks. Pending right, this are uh, just just some checks. <laughs> then the most important thing that happens is this commit and send. Now you see this commit and send. Yeah, again, you write some checks. It just it just does some checks. Um, but all it does at the end of the day, so in here, it's looping through the pending rights and the duplicate rights. Here, it just sets the version. So this version is important because um, inter internally, Badger, for every key you give to it, it appends or yeah, it prepends the key with the timestamp. So that timestamp is the version. So I think it's here. Yeah, new commit timestamp. Yeah, so here. Um, blah, 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 timestamp. Yeah, I mean, we can go in and deep and deep as we want, but it's just basically a unique timestamp, an integer. Uh, so set version just prepends all the keys with um, the timestamp. Not prepares, so it just adds the timestamp as the version of the entry. Then the next thing is we create um, a slice of entries, uh, which is the total list of the pending rights and the duplicate rights. And then, yeah, this function doesn't get called yet. So at this point, we look to the pending right again, and also the duplicate rights, and then we call process entry. All process entry does is that it, uh, so see that thing I told you, this is where we actually merge the, to the key together. We open this, you see. All it does is that given the key and given the timestamp, it creates a new key that is basically the old key, um, plus the timestamp. I mean, the inverse of the timestamp, actually, because it gets the maximum um, integer 64 number and subtracts this timestamp from it. So it's kind of like the inverse. But yeah, but it prepares it with that timestamp. And then that's the new key. Does it make sense so far? Am I going too fast? No, no, no. It's OK. Mm -hmm. So, well, sorry, I just I had to take a break. I'm a little lost, but I think I'm already catching up. So. <laughs> okay. So I've been showing a lot of things. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have shown got into that kind of detail. But the rundown of all I've been saying so far is that when you so when in this update set entry appends all your entries into, into a field in transaction called pending rights and also duplicate rights for the, transact for the entries that are duplicates. So it doesn't actually perform, it doesn't, set entry does not write your entry to disk or to anywhere, it only adds it to that map. Then when we call in updates, when we call commits, um, yeah, it does some checks, a lot of checks. But the most important thing, no, no, this is just a check. Commit and send. It calls commit and send. And the most important thing it does is so far is that for, give the key for all, the, it looks through all the items in the entry map. And then for each of them, for the key, it appends the the timestamp when that key was written. So it picks the key and then appends the timestamp to it. So every key has a timestamp inside of it. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So after doing all of that, all he's done is 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 just this whole function is just to append timestamp to all the keys, and then you now get a final list of entries. The final list of all the entries, both both the pending the ones pending right and the ones that we duplicate, and then it sends it into a channel. Yeah, all of this is noise, but the most important thing is here. Does that make sense? So there's a channel in the database called writes channel. So here it just carries all the requests that all the um, all the entries. It, you know, it adds it to something called a request, a request type um, as a field called entries. You can say entries, and then write it into the channel. That's all. Like all of this is just all the code you see here is mostly just validation and checks to make sure that everything is straight safe and then this is um this is they do a lot of metrics like anytime you see non puts is metric they, they collect a lot of metrics in this package so all the requests go into this right channel that's all now the transaction is done kind of but now you can go on to do other update operations do you now understand how the update works so far? Um, it's not done, this is just half of it. But the part of actually collecting the transaction is done. And do we understand so far? Half of it. Of course, not. it's just half. We've written all the operations into a channel called the right channel. But somebody actually has to pick up those items from the channel and write it to disk. So we've only gone halfway. But do we understand the halfway so far? Yeah, yeah I, think, I, I, think, I think it makes some sense, yeah. Okay, so it, it, it's like um, the transaction, the same transaction model, but now they kind of, instead of like writing to memory, they push like each snapshot of updates. I'm sorry. Yeah, as in, like instead of like some like right ahead log, right? They push each snapshot of updates to a channel to be handled by another party. Yes, yes. So there's a good routine that just busy picking things out. So we can continue and see the other leg. So this function do right is what actually performs the right. So that pending that um channel right channel so it has an infinite for loop here and this is that right channel it's constantly reading from the channel as long as as long as the the app is running it just continues reading from this channel and what it does every time it reads it reads this r and it appends it into this list of requests does that make sense Yes, but why are they using go to? Because this fucked up function is very complicated. If I want, we can walk through it step by step. But it, I think it makes I a lot of sense. The goats, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think the go to. Because okay, there's a lot of loops. <laughs> because the, so the go to is because there are a lot of loops. So there's a loop, there's this for loop, this main for loop, and then there's also this in that for loop inside. Yeah. So anytime a particular case is reached, it's not, you can't just say continue or break from the no. for loop. Because if you, if you continue or break from this for loop, you just go into the parent for loop. Whereas what you actually wanted to do was to skip these two for loops altogether and go somewhere else. Does it make sense? So for example, if you got an event to stop reading from this channel, or, or no, let me let me use here. So you are in the, in, you are in the original for loop. You are now in a in a child for loop, and then you got an event telling you to stop reading. How are you going to stop and go into the parent channel? Do you understand? Yeah, I think go to is, <laughs> I mean, it goes easy way of getting out 
Although I'm, so, I'm getting out, I'm going to the specific point in time that you want. And yeah, I mean, like, I don't think we want to, I mean, we are trying to understand, we don't want to, like, argue on, like, should I sell this possibility of spaghetti and maybe a better way to structure it well? Yeah. <laughs> Goat is weird because people don't use it all the time. But sincerely, there are many scenarios where it's just hard to do it any other way. Especially when you're working with for loops and nested for loops. So what they do is, so if there's an issue, they just keep close case, they just keep and come here. <laughs> of course, another follow. This follow is to drain the channels. But yes, yeah, so here, what they do is simple. Every time a new request comes from that channel, they continue adding all of those requests into a list of requests that they have. But immediately, that list of requests reaches their maximum. You know, which is the max capacity. Then they want to actually write those that current list of requests to hard disk. So they use go to to skip all of this and come down here. So they pick up a go routine. They run a go routine, giving you the list of requests that you should you should go actually go and write. And then they we 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 set this um. This was actually saving as a kind of buffer. So they kind of reset the buffer of requests. So you can start picking new requests again, which would then get processed and then until they finally come here. So the next thing is we can jump into a write request to see how the actual writing works. Oh, okay. So write request was actually a function we defined earlier on. Yes. <laughs> And all it does is, I don't know, it just calls right request. It calls the right request. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all of this is, it's, <laughs> I kind of understand why they did some of the things they did. But man, it can, if you really want to sit down and step through this code properly, like it took me time, like all that code to understand, it can be confusing. Yeah, but I mean, like, it's, I, I, I think it's also part of what we are like, um, is it what we are trying to like, um, following an approach. At least we kind of yes. got an idea of the approach you kind of took in terms of going through tests, if systems are tests, then stepping in through functions you want to you get down there. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know it's not going to be as easy as how you are going through now, but yeah, I think it's also part of it. <laughs> Yes, yes. So let's continue. So in here, this is where we actually we actually get to handle that list of requests. Remember, a request is basically a data type that has a list of entries inside of them. Mm. Remember? So we have a list of requests, and each request has a list of entries in it. Each request is usually the, the equivalent of a transaction. Because in a transaction, you can have multiple, say, operations, like set operations and delete operations. Yes. OK, so let's ignore this for now. So yeah, so to perform the write, the first thing that they do is that they write all that list, the entire list of requests into a value log. So the first rabbit hole has been opened. <laughs> so this value log is, so first of all, if you're, in, if you're in memory mode, there's no need to write to a value log because a value log is basically a file. So here, so there's actually usually a list of, of files for the value log. If you notice here, if you notice that um, the value logs are usually numbered. Do you notice? Okay. Are you guys there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, we just get the maximum one. In, in this our small example, we only created just one. <laughs> but we get the, the maximum, which would be like the latest um, value log, which we're currently writing to. 
and there's a map there's actually a map of all the numbers to the corresponding files so we have this uh, shop which represents the files as you can see it has a pointer to the actual os dot file and then it has like this is almost like a memory map but of the file to a byte yes so there are different file loading modes which we already seen you see the file io load to map and memory map load to ram and memory map yeah there's a key registry which is this file this key registry here um so as you can imagine the key registry also has its own file <laughs> it's like a tree of it's like a tree data structure of files pointed to the corresponding files but yeah let's go back we don't need to worry about this for now but what happens here is just that we get that um, value map struct remember that inside here there is actually a file fd so we'll come back here flush first we'll come back here and to this we'll come back here but what happens is that we look through all of the requests that we have and then inside each request we look through all of the entries in the in the given request so yeah so um yeah here we, we we yeah we create a value pointer and we just keep adding metadata so we're adding the file we're adding the value logs file id to the value pointer for this given um yeah to do anyway let's just keep going down <laughs> the most <laughs> so here we're just building this metadata of um of the request so we're just pretty much building the request then at the end the most important thing that happens is that we call flush writes we, we either when the buffer wait did i mention this buffer okay sorry i should have mentioned this but we actually have a buffer so what we are doing is that we are building the log we're building a list of things we want to write to the files to the actual value logs file and we are building it in memory and we are building it based on the request based on those request entries so for uh -huh, so here uh -huh, i was thinking for you, i think i just skimmed it with my eyes skim past it so here we it's actually protocol buffers yeah, there's a lot of English <laughs> happening here. But at the end of the day, no, this is not the one that I use protocol buffers. Oh. Buffer. Okay, this is kind of like a custom encoding. So for this value log, layout of entry, so it has a custom encoding header, key, value, and CLC too. Okay, so for this particular one, CLC buffer. All right, let's go back. This is just, um, Anyway, but what happens here is that they convert the entry into some form of encoding yeah. and then write it to the end of the buffer. So the buffer is just a byte array, a list of bytes that we are building. And here we check if the list, if the length of that buffer is already larger than a, a kind of maximum file size for a value log. If it is larger than that file size, then we're going to flush. In other words, we're going to write that buffer to the file system. Otherwise, we, we kind of just continue doing the same thing. We, 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 this is just another check to see if it's time to write, if the length of the buffer is 
you know, getting close to the length we want for every a given value log, and then we write it. But we can already go up here to see what flush write actually does. So in flush write, sorry. No, continue. Mm -hmm. So this is in flush write. We are just going to this is this is a, an OS dot file. So we're just going to call write on this os.file type. See fdos.file. Yeah. So here we're just writing the buffer, the entire buffer as it is. I think os.write is just, it's pretty much going to um, append at the end of the file. And then after we've written it, we then reset the buffer so that in a new, um, iterations of this uh -huh. for loop so new iterations of this for loop can reuse the buffer again because we are writing with each request and each request is a list of the transactions so the list of write operations yeah so that's pretty much it so we have these offsets which we are concerned incrementing but i'm not going to go into it and um, after we've done that, we, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much it actually. So we can now go back. So this is for the value log. The value log is, like I told you, is just a log of all the requests that happen at the end of a file. So maybe we can open this value log to see what I'm talking about. If you look close, Okay. If you look closely, um, so if you look closely, so protocol, um, the encoding, I don't know if this one is protocol buffer, but I know the ST is protocol buffer. So, so the encoding still shows you the keys and the values. So you can see key one. Uh -huh. Okay. Just to understand, let's look at the test and then look at the file so we'll see what is happening. Do you notice that in this test, can you see? Yeah, it's not full screen. Okay. So if you okay. notice that we, for, for the transaction, we did set entry 10 times, right? So we set yeah. 10 things inside the transaction before we now save. Now, if you notice, remember that I told you that each transaction is usually, um, remember I told you that each transaction is usually one line, like that's saved together. So you can see key one, value one. It's a bit scattered, but you can see next is key seven, yeah. value seven, key four, value four, right? Then any other operation you do in the future will just append as a new line. So the, wow. This see. Now there's another interesting thing that you're going to see later on is that at the end of this value log uh, of the log, um, at the end of a transaction, so they can be, remember there can be a lot of operations in a transaction. So key one, value one, key two, value two, they are all in a single transaction. Even though they are separate keys, they were persisted in one transaction. So Badger puts this at the end of a transaction to tell it to uh, indicate to itself that that transaction has ended. It puts this Badger exclamation mark TXN at the end of the transaction. There are other keys like this. For, for example, if you do a delete operation, it puts the same thing, badger, delete, or something like that at the end. But when we see this, it will make more sense. It's just a heads up. So we see how this thing works before we see the actual implementation. OK, so I think we're here. Write request. Oh no, we had moved on. Um, yeah. Where were we? Yes, we're here. 
we're here. So remember, we went into vlog that right? And then I showed you how the writing actually happens. In other words, it just appends it to a buffer and then writes the entire buffer to the file system, to the file, to the given file, the latest file for value logs. Then after that, it's done with the value log. Now it's time to actually do the real writes. Remember, the value log is not the database that we are reading from. For the database we're actually reading from, we look to the request again, and then we, this is just some check, because only one operation can be written at a time. And yeah, so we just keep checking to see if there is, if you know, one more person can write. But anyway, the most important thing is this. This function is where we're actually going to write. So now, another story about what Badger is. Badger is an implementation of something called, no, sorry. Is it LTM, LSM? Yeah, LSM. The implementation of something called an LSM tree. Yeah, a lot structured match tree. Yes, yes, yes. Um, do you want to explain what it is? Because my knowledge of it is quite patchy. <laughs> uh, okay, well, so it's, it's not like I've like worked with it. I think it's it's um, it's <laughs> it's like a should I say a try? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure if I can explain it properly. <laughs> but like, it basically what it does is it, it's like it takes a lot of um, is it append logs and allows you to structure them in like a tree format such that you can write um, you can write each each segment to a part of your storage and you can kind of store a pointer to know where to jump to to find the next segment. So yes. uh, I like he has like his limest man explanation <laughs> without yes. going into details of um yes, I think that's pretty much it. Mr. I not to understand this thing. <laughs> we could have no vex if I yeah. And yeah, but I think the advantage is at least you know some data structures that are good for some kind of scenarios when yes. Oh, yeah, so LSM, God. remember we studied B3 in our last class? Yeah. I <laughs> said in our last class. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So um, LSM is kind of, it's, it's LSM and B3 are contestants that the two popular options that people use when they're implementing these data structures. I think this guy left us. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, let's go back. I actually have to study LSM properly. So the the real data structure that um that Badger uses is an LSM tree. So um, now I'm going to write a request to the LSM tree. Um, now the LSM tree is just remember that skip list I showed you. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the skip list is basically skip what list. we use. Yes, that data. Oh yeah, the MC. So it basically puts the element, the entry into the current active skip list which we are working with. Mm. Actually, that's pretty much it. So we yeah. can look at how a skip list works, but that's pretty much it. And okay, so it like it uses the key as like um the yes. So, okay, yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying yes. to map like how the but okay behind the scene the skip list will keep track of each of the is it the um, entries key. Right. Uh, I, 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 
Yes, I guess kind of like how you would use almost any like a any um um link list I, I would say. So it's going to be sorted by the key and then the you know then the value exists. We can look at the implementation also. No, we don't need but, to. I mean <laughs> that's like another <laughs> no okay, so yeah, yeah, but the it's, I'm going to use. okay so once written to this active list, right? Mm -hmm. How does it um I mean what's the purpose of the active list? Because I know there's also another there's another skip list somewhere. No, this is the active skip list. This is the one I was talking about. So there is the active list which we are using actively for all our in-memory writes. And then there is this list which is all the skip lists. Just when a skip list which is its maximum. Oh, okay. <coughs> we just take it and put it here. Yeah. So. This LSM is actually in memory. Come, come see. Oh shit, what did I do? Mm -hmm. Um, what am I looking for? So we are in write requests. So we've written to the log to the value log, send updates, and then write to LSN. Uh, update There's something missing. Let's go back, I'll find it, or I'll just check my notes. I have some notes I took. Because this, LS, this LSM I'm showing you is still the in-memory skip list. Yeah. Well, of course. A, yeah. Um, no, probably there's there's also another like um should I say go routine somewhere that Yes, I think so. But how did I let me check my notes? Excuse me. Let me check. Even the get operations is not that easy for this uh, budget. Uh, yes, they have to be. You know, for for bonds, the get was actually so easy. It's only the right that was a little complex. New transactions. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, I think the we at what point do they now use their like memory map? Um, implementation. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. It's, it's at that point when you're writing it, especially when you're reading, when you're reading, we'll see the memory map. But for the writing, how, how, do, how did I get there again? Let me, so let me trace my steps. Maybe I've missed something. Um, has been closed. Mm. Write requests, db does write requests. The vlog, let's look at the vlog again. So here we just wrote it to bytes. File map for the vlog. Done writing. Encode entry, flush writes, 
Yeah, that's the disc. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right to Ellison. Um, skip this step. Which... Yeah, I think I think many projects don't do some sort of high level um, architecture of of how components um, interact with each other. Mm. I mean, like I I think. <laughs> I mean, we are. I mean, we don't do it either. But it's, yeah, it's, it's like we see, uh, we see the importance when we are studying other people's code. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's, I, I guess many people because uh, maybe open source, so some people tend to like jump into putting fixes or features after the initial design that it now starts like no one comes up i mean imagine <laughs> imagine you having some open source project and then you say um before you contribute code to add this feature uh first you update our our yeah, <laughs> our, yeah. Our, yeah. yeah. i can imagine <laughs> nobody's going to do that shit. <laughs> they'll be like okay you know what we'll just like clone your project and <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> um okay so what we'll do is we'll look at the right and then i i, I think i'll be able to go straight into the code and show you where that persistent happens you it's just funny why i can't the see i'm oh, sorry the reads so where the persistent actually happens is this levels so there's something called levels controllers but it's just weird why i can't see where they like connect together. All right, anyway. Let's go to the reads. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably so, drop something on the channel. So <laughs> Or well, we might actually even find it while doing it. So. Yeah, actually, I think for the reads, we'll see it. So, immediately we get to the levels controller, I'll just code and I'll show you. Yeah, but I know it's, it's, it's all this go with things. All go with things, magic. <laughs> or we go from open to see the go with things that we spawn up. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, so for the view, Yeah. Well, same no, actually, view on its own does not do anything special. It's the same as update. The only difference is that it doesn't commit. So all, all of that logic we're looking at right um, just now was for committing. When you commit, how it queues up all the requests and passes it into the channel, and then how there's a go in reading from the channel, which then commits it into the value log and also commit it into the LSN entry. Yeah. So if we go back, now, but the most exciting thing in view is this transaction.get. You know, in here we've set a lot of transactions, but how does it get those transactions back to return to us? So if we're going to get, we will see this. It's actually an interesting um, chain of things that it does. So the first thing is that if you are already in an, in an update operation, the first of all tries to check the pending rights to see if the key you are looking for is in the list of rights that you just did before now. 
that's if it's in the list of rights that have not yet been committed within this transaction. Um, so if it's inside that list, inside that map, it already returns the value to you for you to use and do what you want to do. Uh, okay. Otherwise, it's remember I told you that all keys get the the timestamp is usually prepended on them or appended to them. So uh, the first thing is that you you append that timestamp back on the new key which the user is trying to search for. Oh, okay. You are, yeah, you append not the same. You append a read timestamp to it, and then you now call the db dot get. So now we can go into db dot get. So this key, remember, is basically the key which the user gave with the timestamp at the end. So the first thing it does is that it tries to, it tries to, where should I find this? So the first thing it does is that it tries to get, to see if the value you are looking for is within those in memory skip list that we created. In other words, if it is still in memory and has not yet been persisted to disk. And this is where, oh, really? yeah. Yeah, pretty much that, yeah. So that's this loop. So these tables, it's, it's looping through. Okay, let's go in here first. Memory table. So this memory table is just basically, as you can see, because it doesn't want to, yeah. Because it doesn't want to have to lock on that skip list or, or on those skip lists. What it does is that it creates a copy of the skip list. You see, yeah, you get what I mean? Yeah. So it copies all of the skip lists so that we don't have to lock on the original skip list. And then returns that list, the entire list of skip lists as a list as something called tables. So this format of this table is that item zero is the current latest skip list. Latest oh, okay. skip list. Then item one, two yeah, is yeah. all the old skip list here in that order. So why this yeah, why, important why is that? Sorry? Now okay, that's what I was asking. Now why is that arrangement? Mm -hmm. So why it's important is that as you would imagine, for a key, it's possible for a key to exist in say in all three levels or in all three. Um, skip mm, list. Okay. But what would usually happen is that remember all of them have a timestamp. So the latest one, this latest, would always be the more recent key or the more recent value. Yeah. So if you notice in here, we look through the table starting from the lowest. So the first value. The first one we find is usually what we're looking for. But in the implementation they have here, in the implementation they have here, they look through all of the tables starting from the lowest, that's the latest zero. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we have a, we have a version, something called um, version, max version. So the maximum version of the value we found, so by default it is new, what we're looking for is new. And then this the version is that's the timestamp. So we just first of all pre-populate it, uh, pretty much with nothing. This is only this only get called for these operations, but ignore that. So what we do is that we first of all get the key from the first level from the first key list. If it is there, if it is not there, we continue. I think the value is near, we continue to the next key list. But if it is there, we what we, they try to do, yeah, they just check if it's near to see if it is there. So what they do is that they check the version. Is the version that we found, um, so is the version that we found that the timestamp greater than this variable that we say, remember by default, in the first iteration, this value will be zero. 
So let's say we found an item in, in skip list number zero. So we st store this version in here and then we continue the loop again to check all of the skip list. So what we are basically doing is that with each iteration, we are checking each skip list to see if there's a version of that, of that value. If there's a version of that value that is more recent, that the timestamp is more recent than the previous value we found. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, so all of this looking just to find the most recent version of that value. So if we found it, so if we found, or if we found yeah, the exact version we're looking for, or if, this just means if we did not, if after this iteration, we did not find a new one, it's going to return at this level because the version will be the version of the, the current version that we find will be the version of the old um, variable that we've set here below. So I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> but anyway, we will return if, when we finally find the key that is the most recent, we are going to return that key and we will not bother going into the file system. Okay. But if we did not find this key, in any of the skip lists, we're not going to go into this file system. This LC is something called a level controller. Level controller. Mm. So, yeah, so levels controller. <sighs> Wait, let me drink my tea small. <laughs> mm. Bad job. Bad job for the And they have so much stuff just happening, which is interesting. Like they have way more moving parts than even bonds did. Yeah, but I think because they have some sort of robots, robust like testing system to ensure that at least mm. Mm. <laughs> things don't break apart. Like half of their files here are all tests. <laughs> uh, almost half, yeah. Almost every file has a test. <laughs> they even like collecting every metric they can. <laughs> You've been seeing them, right? All yeah, the metric yeah. collection. Anytime you see this, why? Where was it? We just saw it. Yeah. There it is. Um, non meta table. Yes. Non. Yes. This is metrics. Anytime you see something like this, is metrics, and they collect a lot of them. Uh huh. So now we are going to do get on this levels controller. Uh -huh. So this levels controller, I think, is actually like an LSM implementation. Remember what you were explaining about LSM? Sorry. I thought I had my browser open. <laughs> this computer has never ceased to amaze me. Okay, here it is. I think. Can we find the diagram of LSM? LSM diagram. I think there's one at the top of the wiki. Yeah, but that's compaction. That's one is just explaining compaction. Okay. Um, I don't think. You <laughs> should check with the full name. Check what? With the full name instead of abbreviating it to LSM. Okay. Yeah, it seems there's a linear scheduling method. Uh, it's also. But it's funny how just studying these databases, we've learned quite some data structures. Like we learned about our trees and B trees and all that stuff in the last class. Yeah. <laughs> class again. Now this time we are um, learning about skip lists and LSM and all that. I mean, this so is. I don't think it's based on anything. 
Sorry? Sorry? I don't think you pressed enter after uh -huh. typing. Press nine again. Maybe I have to what press yes. you enter. Can you imagine? I think Safari does not support pressing enter to search <laughs> on Google search. <laughs> yeah, see now. Oh, now it's working. I don't understand it yet. It was not working before. Okay. This computer is uh, the nervous system is me. <laughs> okay, so this is LSM. This can memory. Wow, I think I'm more confused just looking at these pictures. <laughs> Okay, how about this? Let's check a video. <laughs> Probably LSM append on the data structures. Can we, let's watch this. It's a six minute video. Oh, okay. You won't be able to hear me. Yeah, that's hang on. I'm on my headset. Um, how do I disconnect my headset? Okay, you're asking how <laughs> can you can meet the file as a log record. So, okay, yes, it's a log record. You can hear now, right? What are the changes I made yes. to this point? Okay, that brings me to another background technology that I have to explain to you, and which is called log structured file system. The idea here is that when I make a change to file Y, meaning I either append to the file or make some modifications to it, what I'm gonna do is rather than write the file as is, I'm gonna write the change that I made to the file as a log record. So I have a log record that says, what are the changes I made to this file X? Similarly, I have a log record of all the changes I made to this file why? And this is being done in a data structure, which I'll call log segment. And I'll keep this log segment data structure in memory, of course, to make it fast in terms of the file system operation. So with this log segment data structure, what I can do is buffer the changes to multiple files in one contiguous log segment data structure. So this log segment data structure, I can write it out as a file. And when I write it out, I'm not writing a single file, but I'm actually writing a log segment which contains all the changes made to multiple files. And because the log segment is contiguous, I can write it sequentially on the disk and sequential writes are good. In I the don't think this is helping me. <laughs> can we continue our exploration? <laughs> hey. Uh, well, yeah, so I mean, well, okay, let's go through the, the gets, right? Um, let's see. I think the get basically is searching through the, okay, this is not the skip list anymore, right? Yeah. So it's the, um, yeah, it's not, it has, it's done with skip list. Now it is in the LSM. So the LSM tree has different levels. Um, I think by the definition, it, it has like like level zero. Let me open it. It's written there in the Wikipedia. So, um, level zero. Uh, it's kept in memory. Okay. Yeah, two level, two tree like structures. I thought I saw zero. Yeah, this third paragraph. Okay, third paragraph. Yes, yes. Most LSM trees used in practice um, employ multiple levels. Level zero is kept in main memory. Oh, so it's kept in RAM and might be represented using a tree. The on disk data is organized into sorted runs of data. Each run contains data sorted by the index key. A run may be represented on disk as a single file, or alternatively as collection of files with non-overlapping key ranges. To perform a query on a particular key to get its associated value, one must search in the level zero tree and each run. Okay, so it, it loops through 
most likely from the beginning. So the first level would most likely be level zero. So it's important to note that we iterate the levels from zero on upward. The reason is if we iterate in opposite order or in parallel, naively calling all the h dot r lock in some in some order, we could read our level level l stables post compaction and level l plus one stables pre compaction. If we do parallelize this, we will need to call the r lock function in increasing order of the level number. Okay, let me not pretend like I understood that, but let's continue. <laughs> so, um, so the, the goal of, I've, I've been through this code before anyway. It made sense then, but they basically um, always call with a level. Let's go back to well, how we got here. Okay, so it starts with level zero. Yes, so for the, um, the list of tables. I think it's at the bottom. It's at the bottom. If they can't, um, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. If yes. it's no more in memory, they check. Yes, you're right. Sorry. I didn't see that. So it starts with level zero. And then, yeah, if it's less than level zero, it continues. So this should not happen, hopefully. So for each level, they run h.get on that level. So let's go in and see. We see, so they keep increasing the levels. So let me go back and confirm. Did they increase the level? I know, I think it's just a start level, right? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. This is a range, so it will keep increasing the level. If it's not found um, here, it will continue in the next level. Okay, it's definitely not a skip list. In a skip list, you always start from the highest level and then come down. So, um, so they the again to they they call this function. I uh, I don't remember what this function was doing. Yeah, but get table for key, and if it's level zero, it's going to. Oh yeah, I remember this. So there's this increment. So they do some kind of, of GC, manual GC. So each level has a, has, each table has a file associated with it. If you go into tables.table, there's a file associated with it, FD. You see this, right? So what happened is that they delete the file when when um, something becomes zero, let me check. Wait. Is this it the ref? Reference. Yes, to the reference. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Reference. So every time somebody wants to access this table, they increment the reference. And then when they are done, they decrement the reference. And when the reference reaches zero, the table gets deleted. So, but anyway, that aside, the main operation they do here is that uh, they basically, they have a list of tables and they want to find an item in the table. So what they do is that they compare, they compare um, the key you are looking for against the highest, the maximum, um, value the maximum key that each table holds. Do you understand? So it's like it's like bucketing. Let's say you have number you have number one to hundred. So let me connect back my headset and in the meantime catch my breath. Oh, okay. Just give me a second. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so let's say you have, the way they, they, they work is that, let's say you have values one to 100. Those values one to 100 could be divided across 10 tables. So each of the tables has a lowest and the largest like if you go into the table, you see smallest and biggest. Smallest and biggest. 
So they basically store, each table keeps track of the smallest key they have and the biggest key which they have. And so when you want to search, to search, you basically, you don't go through all of the tables to find which table has your key. Instead, you, you search for which table, is it which table, starting from the lowest table, you check for which table this, such that the biggest key they have is greater than your key, which you are searching for. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what this search is basically trying to do. It's trying to find a table which the biggest item they have is greater than you know, the current key you're looking for, which means that table most likely has the value you're looking for. So this now just gives them the index of that table inside the list of tables. And then, of course, here they now pick out the table from that um, list of tables. So now within the table, yeah, OK, yeah, this, this function is just to get the table that might have, have the value you're looking for. So now given that particular table that we've got, um, this is just going to be one. It's a loop, but it's just one table most of the time. So now, um, here now, they do, this is where they do that LS, that bloom filter here. So now we have, we have the key that we're looking for. They use the bloom filter to check, is it possible that this table does not have this key that I'm looking for? Before they start going to file system, because you, you remember that file system operations are more expensive than actually any operation, even look going through a map is more expensive than just checking if a key exists in a blue filter. So blue yeah. filters are super efficient. So this just checks if that hash, that, the hash of that key is in that bloom filter. So that if it's not in the bloom filter, we don't need to continue going to this because you can be sure the no's are 100%. It's only the yes that is a maybe in, with bloom filters. So with the no's now, you, you can just skip and not bother checking the table. It means that the key does not exist. So you return early. But if the bloom filter tells you, yes, we might, maybe we have this key, the next thing you now need to do is you need to iterate across that particular table. So in the table, the table has a function called seek. So yeah, yes. let me go back, seek again, and then seek from. Uh -huh. So in this case, because we are not, uh, you can do prefix searches. So, but in this case, we are just looking for a key the entire key. So they use seek from, but the origin is this, is zero. Uh -huh. So they call seek from, given your key and origin zero. Aha, uh -huh. remember we did this one night like that. This project took me a few days of studying now, and I still don't understand this project. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe we should be breaking it up into two. Like, I yeah, think so at least projects like this one, because it's also easier to explain a small section first and then explain the rest of the section another time. Yeah, probably maybe that's what we should be doing for relatively large projects. Like, we mm. probably do a first segment and then move to the next segment. Mm. So I think, so for example, you know what, maybe we should do this. Let's end this here. Then we continue again next period, at least. So even people that will probably watch this video will know how to move on. Then we can properly explain how the LSM tree. Um, uh -huh. Then I, I'll have more time to study it properly. Yeah, exactly. So maybe that's what I think. I think this, this is a good way to actually learn how to jump into bigger projects. I don't think doing everything at one day would be good. We can probably yes. see what it is. Because I mean, we have we've gotten through the exterior and we're like entering the meat of the details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the real meat though. <laughs> but but from this point, it, 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 you start seeing all the file operations where they are skipping yeah. particular points within the 
Oh goodness. Oh, this is the meat. <laughs> Well, so yeah, I think maybe because I think we will extend it. Yeah, we are over two hours now. Yes, yes. So yeah, so yes, I mean, this, this has been really awesome. Um, is Ken is still here? Ken. Probably maybe Ken. Yes, I think he's still here. Still maybe here. Ken then might want to like lead the next session. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> Hey, everybody else has the next session. Don't need. Uh, yeah, actually, Ken is the perfect person to lead the next session because he's presenting about data driven work. We need the practice. Wait, where would the next session be? Uh, so it depends. We can we can determine be a week or two weeks. We can determine on the Slack uh, on the Discord channel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, I could do it then. Sweet. Oh, no, I'll yeah. start this properly also. Yeah. Yeah, let me stop the recording for now. So we can just, oh, okay, left before. All right. Um. <laughs>